Okay, I'm here today to talk about Linux time travel mode. Um, I get into what that is and how to apply it to network simulation. So, what? Here's my introduction. Let's talk about time travel first. The the term was coined on mailing list discussions. We don't really have time travel in the sense that we can go back in time or something like that. But we do skip time forward when the system is idle so that kind of the system travels through time much faster than real time. And all of this is implemented on user mode Linux, which is a, a kind of virtual machine. I don't know if everyone is familiar with it, but it's a port of Linux to its own user space. So it runs as a, runs the kernel as a user space process. And then any process running inside of the kernel, it's just a normal process that the user mode Linux P traces to be able to intercept the system calls. So why would we want to do this? Really the, the main motivation for this is testing and that's in different ways. Testing here, it applies in different ways. So you might want to use it for speed because if you have time travel, then anything that you're waiting for basically could collapse down to nothing. We have some examples there where two minutes wait um, just kind of collapsed to a second or so. Or maybe you have something that you want to test that doesn't exist yet. So you have a simulation for the device, but your simulation is slower than real time. And if it's slower than real time, then your virtual machine might get timeouts or something like that if it's talking to the device. Or you might have something that you can't reproduce because you don't have the network topology. You don't have a way of testing a very long latency link because you would have to actually build a very long latency link, which usually implies a very long distance. So all, all these kinds of things might be things that you don't have unless you're simulating the system. Or you might have things where, you're, where you don't have enough CPU speed to do what you want to do. You might want to log everything or trace everything. You might want to enable all kinds of kernel debug options. And when you do that, your tests time out because certain things don't happen fast enough. Or you might want to do some manual debugging where you don't know exactly what's happening in the system. So you want to attach the debugger, but you don't want everything else to keep running. So when you're using this mode, time will stop. You can go to lunch and pick up exactly where you left off and nothing else will have happened in the system, neither in the one machine nor another machine nor any device that you're simulating or the network that you're simulating. So that's really the, the motivation. All of it is around testing, being able to reproduce certain things. It's also, it can be a lot more reproducible because you're not dependent on, you know, maybe we're applying this to wireless network. So it, everything would depend on how your medium access works, how much other devices are around you. And here that doesn't apply. It's all in a simulation. Everything is basically deterministic. There's some leaks of determinism because you still have random numbers in the device, in, in the virtual machine. You still have the real time when the system started in the virtual machine. So things are slightly different every run, but mostly it's deterministic. So how do we, how do we implement this? First of all, we wanted this time travel. So we implemented in user mode Linux, three time travel modes. One is just basically time, called time travel. This is on actually the command line argument you have to give to user mode Linux. In this mode, it will skip time forward if it's possible, if it gets to idle, but it will never be slower than real time. So it would actually arm some timers so that you get a, every 10 milliseconds, you could get a tick. I'm not going to go into the details here because all, a lot of the advantages that I mentioned before don't apply in this mode. You still get time ticking even if you're stopping in the debugger or something like that. And then the second one is an extension kind of to this where you have time travel equals inf CPU. In this mode, we're simulating infinite CPU speed. So time doesn't change until we get into an idle state or into a delay. In this mode, we don't have any preemption. So if you have an infinite loop or something like that, it will certainly hang the entire system. The simulation will just stop there because it's trying to simulate finishing that because it's an infinite CPU speed and then go back to idle. But it's very it's, it has big advantages when you're doing the simulation because you can intercept it, you can look at it, you can do whatever you want with it without really affecting the time inside of the simulation. And then an extension to that, to the inf CPU mode, is the extension, extended mode where we're extending this out to multiple machines or multiple 
parts that are simulated, multiple devices, multiple machines. And that has time travel X connecting to a given controller socket. But let's talk about time travel itself first before we connect it out to some other machine. So the underlying mechanisms we really need are four things that the kernel relies on. So the first thing is, what time is it? Obviously it has to know. This is called the clock source, struct clock source in Linux. The second thing is, please wake me up in a certain amount of nanoseconds. So when you, when the, when the system has nothing to do or when the scheduler is ticking, it will tell you, please wake me up in 10 milliseconds. But if someone armed the timer, it might be, please make, wake me up in one millisecond or something like that. But in the kernel, sometimes drivers might do something like N delay or M delay or even CPU relax. So we also need wait just a little without scheduling. If we're not scheduling, we just need to wait a little bit of time. It's significantly less than the scheduler tick, which is 10 milliseconds with contract hertz equals 100. But here it might just be wait a couple of nanoseconds. And then most importantly for the whole time travel is when there's nothing to do, right? Arc CPU idle. That's where we get when the system has nothing to do. So how do we do all these four? First, what time is it? Normally in user mode Linux, this just asks the host. It says clock get time, what time is it for the host? And that's it. In time travel mode, it's even simpler. We just read the current internal time. It's the U64 that's tracking the current time in nanoseconds and that's it. We have to make this cost a little bit of time. Just the act of asking the question, what time is it? Has to cost a little bit of time because of boundary conditions in, in some user space applications but that's just a little caveat there. Please wake me in. Um, normally in user mode Linux, this just does timer set time. So then when the timer expires, you will get a signal, the process will be interrupted and you will know to trigger this as an interrupt into the Linux system that's being simulated. In time travel mode, we really don't have to do anything except remember when that wake up should actually be. Waiting a little bit, normally in user mode Linux has no special implementation. We just delay per the normal loops per Jiffy that's calculated at system boot. Um, and so if you want to delay one nanoseconds with an end delay, it will calculate how many loops it has to take and do these this many loops. Or if you have CPU relax, it might be a knob or something like that. In time travel mode, we can't work that way because time doesn't change when we're just spinning on the CPU. This is simulating an infinite CPU speed. So whatever loops per Jiffy or something that we're doing, however many loops we're doing is taking zero time. So here in time travel mode, this must actually move time by an appropriate number of nanoseconds. For N delay, that's pretty simple. M delay also, we can calculate how many nanoseconds. And right now for CPU relax, that just takes always one nanosecond. And finally, the most important thing, when there's nothing to do, Normally, user mode Linux will just sleep for one second. So then that never actually happens because it will be interrupted by the timer that it was armed before when the clock, clock event source requested it. Um, this doesn't happen in time travel mode. In time travel mode, we also sleep for up to a second, but only in the sense that we move the clock forward by either one second or the next wake up time. Again, the one second doesn't really happen because there's always a next wake up time for the internal tick for, for Linux and then it will trigger the timer interrupt. So usually this is with config hertz equals 100, this would be every 10 milliseconds. So you would go into idle, move time forward by 10 milliseconds, break out, trigger the timer interrupt, go back into the scheduler, maybe figure out that there's nothing to do and go back into the loop again. So this is the four things that we need for like the basic time travel mode. What can we do with that? So really we can do it with that only a single machine, but we can speed up tests. This is very useful. We've had it for quite a while and we converted the supplicant tests upstream to use it and it gives a more than six times speed up for the tests. Like I mentioned before, there's an example of the DFS tests where there's 120 seconds to two minutes where we have to wait for an event just by regulatory reasons. And we don't want to just hack out our code for testing. So we wait for two, two minutes for an event that can never happen in simulation. But here that doesn't take nearly that long because all we're doing is simulating waiting for two minutes. 
And so that just wakes up every 10 milliseconds for those two minutes, sees that there's nothing to do and goes back to the next 10 milliseconds. Or another thing that used to be very problematic in the supplicant tests, if you enabled all the kernel debug options, it would cause user space to eventually time out if your CPU isn't fast enough. Now with in simulating infinite CPU speed, we don't care. We can enable whatever we want. We can debug and trace whatever we want. It's not really taking any time as far as the, the supplicant and the other programs running inside of the simulation are concerned. So also that means it's disconnected from real time and we can oversubscribe the CPUs. If something else starts up on the system that we're running the test on while we're running the test, we don't really need to care. Before it used to be that you can only load the system to a certain extent until tests are timing out. So very useful, but also kind of limited. And of course we want more. So the first thing that we want is multiple machines. For multiple machines, we have to make some modifications. We have to do some cooperative scheduling between the instances. And we created a simple protocol that's declared in UM time travel that where, where one machine can request runtime, wait for its turn, get the current time, update the current time if necessary, and get a signal that it's able to run when it's being when it when it has waited for its turn, it will get a signal to run. And there's an optimization there. If no one has anything to do, there's a free until where you can run without communication for some time. And this plugs into all of the four areas that I mentioned before. And now when we get to idle or some kind of delay, we basically don't just skip time forward or to the next event that we had, but we actually have to ask the controller. So we have to ask the controller what, what we can do, or we have to ask the controller what we want to do basically. And then we wait until it's our turn. And then when we're told to run, we run until completion, when we get back to the next delay or the next idle, and then we repeat the whole thing over and over. So for this, we need a controller application, which basically contains only really a, a kind of calendar that keeps track of each participant's next event. So everyone requests some time when, it wants to, when they want to run, and the controller keeps track of which one is next and which one should be running. And then, then when one of them goes to wait state, the one that's next will be notified that it's able to run. The controller also has to distribute the time updates because if one of them ran, then time will have moved a little bit. Um, and then when the next one runs, it has to be told what time it is now. I'm working to release all of this as open source, including the device simulation that I will talk about, but it's not been released yet. So now if we have multiple machines, that's nice, but it's not very useful because for multiple machines to be useful, they have to be able to communicate with each other somehow. So we need devices. And devices are sort of conceptually simple. They really just need to communicate with a time controller, but we just had a protocol where they can. We just created a protocol where they can. They can just behave just like a virtual machine and request runtime, wait for their turn to run, and then they get a signal to run, and then they run for some time, etc. So that part is simple. And they need to communicate with the device driver. Normally, a device might communicate with the device driver using PCI Express or USB or something. But of course here, we don't have that. In user mode Linux, there are in fact, none of these are implemented. So, but for virtualization, we already have standards, right? So we have VertIO, we have vhost user that extends that out. So VertIO is very useful for virtualization. It's a standard model. It has existing drivers, existing infrastructure, basically all we want. But then we need to implement the device in the hypervisor. And here in user mode Linux, the hypervisor is basically the same as Linux. So we would have to link our application, our device application against Linux if it's just raw, just simple vert IO. But QMU designed a vhost user protocol that pulls the device implementation out of the hypervisor. And so we can use this protocol to pull out our device implementation out of the hypervisor. And the Linux just makes, the Linux instance that we're running, user mode Linux, just makes a connection to the device over the Unix domain socket that this protocol uses. So we implemented VOS user support in user mode Linux, and then feels like we should be done. But it's not really that simple because we're trying to simulate. 
And in a normal vhost user model, let's say we want to transmit the network frame. The host will put a frame on the vert queue. The host will then notify the device that there is something on the vert queue using an event FD. And then the device will get the signal and handle the frame, very simple. But if we look at it in the simulation, it starts to break down because we are not actually running both of the applications in parallel. Both of the applications are connected to the time controller and they have to request runtime and get their runtime share, etc. So what we have to do in this model for the vert IO for the VOS user protocol is that the host again, it puts the frame in the vert queue as it used to be. But then the host notifies the device using an in-band signal. If we use an out-of-band signal, then we don't have any feedback of when that signal is processed. And here we need, so we need an in-band signal here because then the device needs to ask the controller for time to run. So maybe it wants to simulate a 10 nanosecond interrupt latency. So it would ask for 10 nanoseconds in the future I want to run so that I can process the interrupt. The controller will then actually talk to some other participants in the simulation. It might have to update them. It might have to do some other things, but it will eventually put that event 10 nanoseconds in the future onto the calendar that it maintains for the device. Then it will return back to the device and say, yes, you've got that slot on the calendar. Then the device will return back to the host, send an acknowledgement back to the host using the vhost user reply arc extension so that the host knows, okay, now the device knows that it needs to run and it's requested runtime. Now the host can continue running until it gets to some kind of idle state or delay state or whatever it needs to do. Maybe it needs to send another packet to the device until the queue is full or something. So it will continue running and this may happen again. But eventually the host will hit some kind of idle state and it will tell the controller that it's finished running, will wait for its next turn. But now the controller, instead of telling the host, the virtual machine that it can run, will presumably tell the device to run so that now the device can finally handle the frame. And handling the frame will usually incur some other logic. It might simulate some network latency um, and so request more runtime from the controller in the future to actually send the frame out to the recipients, etc. This is very, feels very complex, but luckily it's all handled by the Vert.io code that we put into user mode Linux that connects out to, over the VOS user protocol. And on the device side, this part where you get the signal, but you don't really run the interrupt until you get time from the controller, etc., is all encapsulated in the VOS user library code that's part of the framework that we're planning to release. So let's do something with it, right? We've, that was theory. For a wireless device, we used to already have hardware SIM where on a single machine, you can simulate many radios. And this is what the supplicant uses for the tests that I mentioned before. The supplicant will simulate any number of radios that it needs for its test inside a single virtual machine and they will communicate. We also used to already have WMediumD, which is running inside of that same virtual machine or the same system as the hardware SIM to simulate the network in a more, in a more capable way. So WMediumD can simulate other things that the hardware SIM by itself cannot simulate. Path loss or things that happen on the wireless medium can be simulated with WMediumD. So now we want to pull WMediumD, which is sitting inside the same virtual machine as hardware SIM, we want to pull it out to be sit, to sit side by side as another application so that multiple instances of hardware SIM can connect to the same W medium D with, from multiple VMs. So we extended that protocol that hardware SIM already has, it's a Netlink based protocol. We basically just extended that to be transported over vert IO instead of over Netlink inside the machine. So now it's, instead of being inside the machine in Netlink, it's going outside of the machine over Vert.io. And then WMediumD just has to be the device implementation for this protocol, but it already knows the protocol. So it's really just a different transport that it has to know about. And so then it has to have, it, it creates a device for every socket connection that you make to it. And those devices plug into the existing system of frame forwarding, etc. All of WMediumD was ported to this framework and all of this is also already upstream. 
but the controller application was in part here. So now with that, we can actually simulate multiple devices, multiple instances, multiple hosts, multiple virtual machines, each with a radio talking to each other over a W medium D that's running separately. So now we can have really have multiple instances of Linux rather than just everything having, having everything in a single instance of Linux. So let's see how that works in the demo. I have a script that starts four things. We'll start the time controller, which includes a very simple VirtIO Ethernet device switch. The, it starts WMediumD offering hardware SIM VirtIO devices and of course connecting them on a virtual air together. And it runs two instances of Linux. One goes into the background and one that we can see. On the first machine that we can see, it will run then run a script that sets up an ad hoc or IBSS network, connects using SSH to the second machine to also set it up. And when they're connected, it will ping from the first to the second machine over the simulated wireless that goes to W medium D, etc. Um, to show to show that. Around the whole script, I'm running TS to show how much time elapsed. And inside on the ping, it will also run TS from the script to show how much time elapsed there because I'm pinging once every minute. And on the outside, I'm, I can see how much faster it goes. So let's run it. It's starting up. And now it's connecting and now it's already pinging. So you can see inside it's pinging once every minute. And outside it takes about one second for every ping. The reason it takes one second to simulate one minute is that you have two machines and both machines aren't really idle. We still need to wake up for the Linux kernel tick. These are configured to config Hertz equals 100 and synchronize that across the machines and go, you know, only one of them is running at a time because of the time sim simulation. And so it takes some time. If you add more machines, it goes significantly slower but with a few machines it's reasonable and you can see that it's simulating one minute pretty much every one second maybe a little less and um, of course if you have a lot of network traffic then simulation will be a lot slower because the network traffic also has to go hit the time simulation all the time so that's the easy demo um, i don't have a demo for any other devices but here we already showed we already saw an Ethernet device, which was kind of in the background with the SSH that controlled it, and the wireless device the devices that we that we did the ping on. So let's summarize what we've done. With just raw time travel mode, we can disconnect real time from simulated time. And so we can run faster or slower than real time. Our simulation might be CPU bound, but or it will always be CPU bound, really. But depending on the simulation complexity, we can be faster or slower than real time. This, for a single machine, we already use for testing host APD and supplicant. And it's great because it makes things a lot faster. Now, if we want to extend this to be able to simulate networks or multiple machines or some other things, then we have this UM time travel protocol and the controller application to be able to do that. But if we don't have any devices, that's not very useful. So we extended the VHOS user protocol with the in-band signaling extension and also use the reply act protocol extension to be able to simulate devices within the time simulation. And that we already have for Ethernet, very simple as part of the controller application because we need to have a virtual kind of lab network where you have the ability to connect between the different machines before Wi-Fi is brought up. And we did it for Wi-Fi and W medium D so that we have the ability to simulate wireless networks with multiple machines. And at Intel, we also use this already for real firmware testing. So we've com compiled the real firmware in a way that it can use VertIO. We've added VertIO to our driver and so that it can communicate with all these pieces. So the firmware can also communicate with hardware SIM and we can test hardware SIM being the access point, for instance, connecting to W medium D, and then our firmware also connecting to W medium D in a separate user mode Linux instance with our real driver running there 
driving the firmware API and doing testing like that. Again, this might be slower or faster than real time, depending on what we do. You saw in the demo, we saw that it can be a lot faster than real time if not, nothing happens. But if there's a lot happening, it might actually be slower than real time. And that's it. I am hoping that we will release all of the necessary code soon. And I'm hoping also that I won't be the only one using it. Thank you. OK, um, thanks, Johannes. Uh, do we have any questions? Let's see. Go through this. OK, uh, from the top, uh, does time travel guarantee the ordering of events? You might be muted. Yep, sorry, they muted me. Um, it, I'm not even sure I understand the question correctly. If you if you could elaborate, I mean the 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 ordering of events kind of goes back to what your scheduler is doing and how your timers were um, were triggered. And if you have incoming packets or something, it depends on what your what your device is simulating. Um, well, so so, so any any time. So it's my question, and um, what I was thinking right. is, so timers. I assume that. Even if timers are differ different by one microsecond, they are ordered. So presumably sure. that is maintained. Uh, but are there any other sort of events in the system that we implicitly order because of, of these delays that might um, become unordered in this case? I, I can't really think of any way that would happen. I mean, one one thing also to note is that user mode Linux is, isn't SMP at this point, so. You're not really doing anything in parallel, and so um, if if you have two event, events that were meant to be in a certain order and they have some kind of time constraint between them in a certain order, then that should be preserved. It's just the the way the scheduler would work, right? And if something is actually going to do an end delay or something, then the CPU is busy at that point. Now. I, I did mention that we don't have preempt here, right? So if you have some long running loop and you expect that loop to spit out events uh, every once in a while, and something else would um, would so something else would consume them, then this probably wouldn't work, right? Right? It's, it's, if it's CPU bound or something that actually takes CPU time to to create events in a certain order. Okay. Uh, the question from David Poole. This may be a little more about. Uh, UML, but is UML still under active development? The mailing list is very quiet. What do we know about that? Yeah, it's, I mean, Richard is the maintainer and he hasn't been merging as much as I like. Um, and I don't know, it's kind of half active, I guess. I, I've been fixing it up. Anton, another contributor there, has been working on network drivers, so you know, clearly he's using that also. Um, I did look at use, doing this in KVM initially, but it's much, much, much more complex. So user mode Linux was kind of a cheap way out. Um, we'll see how that works out in the future. I can't really say it's actively maintained. We've been trying to do things here and there. Someone's been doing KA Sun support, but it didn't go anywhere yet because it has some issues. And um, I, I would say for now it works, but it has, still has issues. I fixed up LockDev some time ago for it, so, be, so I would be able to test it. But. Okay, uh, question from Eric Dimese. Um Have you used clone new time? Looks like you kind of answered, but- um, do you have Yeah, any not really. I mean, this is running a, a complete virtual machine in a sense, right? And so clone new time is within the system. Um, so no, it's not really related. Uh, it'd be great if you could share the script. Yeah, I look at that. Uh, that would be nice. So I think that's probably going to be true of uh, the presentations, obviously, the scripts and open source. We always want to share. Yep. Is there any restriction of drivers or applications which we have to modify code to simulate over time travel? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we found a number of bugs in applications this way because if you in, if you simulate infinite CPU speed then you will find that some applications are just trying to eat as much CPU time as they can get. And um, those kinds of simulations you can't use under this mode because you will never move time forward, right? 
We've actually found bugs in some applications where even W medium D that I mentioned had a bug. It wasn't doing some timing thing right. And so it was sitting there in a busy loop that no one ever noticed. Um, rather than going into its event loop, into its select loop, it was just sitting there in a busy loop. So th those are the kinds of things that we found. Um, so yeah, it, it may not run every application, but as far as the Wi-Fi stack up and down, everything we've tested so far is concerned, the applications are event driven. They're not doing CPU based polling or something like that. So that works. Question from Steve Jarcio. If the controller application is an OSS yet, can we do the HWAM host APD test as described in the wireless workshop last week? Yes, because they run only in a single machine. How hard was it to get your driver to run in UML? Except from Jesse. That was actually really simple. We just ported it to Vertio. We had a transport abstraction. And um, that was the easiest part, really. The, the harder part it was on the device side to get the device to to run in a, in a user space environment, to get the device from Virtu to work there. Question from Borgat. At what resolution is scheduling happening? So, so the time travel works at nanosecond resolution um, because that's the underlying mechanisms that, that Linux uses there at that level. The, so that's also the, the scheduling of the VMs and stuff. Um, but of course, you know, your, your Jiffy's based timers or something in the kernel are still going to happen at that resolution. Um, another question about UML. Seems to be an interesting side yeah. topic. Uh, can UML run hardware drivers? You know no, that? basically okay. no. I mean, that's why we did the for IO. You don't have um, you don't have IO memory or anything like that that you can simulate. So um, maybe it would be possible. I looked at it simulating PCI layer at some point, but it's just so much work that going to Vertio is much much simpler. Uh, so normal hardware drivers won't really be able to run. That's another reason I looked at KVM initially. Um, but then KVM, you have like three, four different clock sources in the in the system, and you have SMP to worry with, worry about, and it gets a lot more complex. Okay. So I think um, let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, presentation. Thank you, Johannes.